Colin, who is really concerned about this in the comments, M1 Max and excessive SSD read writes, what's going on? So Colin's referring to a story that's come out over the last couple of weeks where some people are claiming that they're seeing exactly that, excessive read and writes to the SSD on M1 Max, which has made them concerned that those SSDs will just age out, wear out uh, far sooner than they should. Now, there is nothing that is different in terms of how an M1 Mac interacts with the SSD than a traditional Intel Mac. They all use the same sort of high-end premium SSD parts sourced by Apple. They have the same custom firmware written by Apple. And all recent Macs include the same sort of custom silicon controllers for the SSD, either on the M1 chip or previously on a T2 or a T1 chip that just tries to make sure the process is as optimal as possible. Now there could be something just unforeseen or unintended on the interaction specific to M1 that nobody has accounted for. There could be an issue with the tools being used to measure all this. Maybe they're not accurate when it comes to M1 Max, or the people seeing this could be using some software that hasn't been ported properly to the M1 and is causing things like memory leaks that is just churning, just thrashing the swap on the SSDs. There are a number of possibilities here. I know a lot of people are looking into it. I believe Apple is looking into it since they saw the same reports that we all have seen, but nothing so far seems to have been discovered about it. So I'm usually cautious about this stuff and I try to get as much information as possible so I can give you as much information as possible. And I never wanna stress or sensationalize or cause anyone to get any anxiety about this at all. I wanna give you, I wanna empower you. I wanna make sure you have the answer so you don't have to worry. And there's just not enough information in this case yet. But if and when I hear anything at all, I will make sure absolutely to update all of you immediately. Sponsored by CuriosityStream with Nebula. As always, members over at patreon.com slash Renee Ritchie have Q&A priority, but if you have anything else to ask, anything to follow up on, hit the subscribe button and bell so we can hang out in the comments and chat just whenever a new video goes live. Aziz Rahman on Patreon asks, why are Apple postponing Face ID on iMac until next year? And I actually don't know that they are. That's been one of the reports. I think Mark Gurman said that the Face ID iMacs aren't ready yet. I find that hard to believe because Face ID, Apple announced it way back in 2017 with the iPhone 10, and they've just been slow in bringing all this biometric technology to the Mac. And I'm sure there are issues and reasons, and it's always easier for me, who has no responsibility at all to actually implement and ship any of this to say it's going way too slow, but it's going way too slow. And Face ID just seems like such a no brainer, such a, an incredible boost to both security and convenience. I would have hoped that Apple would bring it to the Mac a couple of years ago um, and that we don't have it now is endlessly frustrating. So if Apple is really going to the trouble of redesigning all of these new Macs, the iMacs, the MacBook Airs, I really, really, really think we should absolutely get Face ID on them just as soon as is technologically possible. Craig Duran on Patreon asks, is there anything that can be extrapolated from Apple offering eight core and seven core GPU options? And that's what's currently being offered on the M1 MacBook Air, but Apple previously did the same thing with the 2018 A12X iPad Pro. And all it means is that the yield rates aren't high enough. They're not getting enough chips off the fab that have all eight cores functional. So if they were gonna only use the eight core versions because the yields are lower, they would have to charge more, be much more expensive for that chip. But by using the ones that have seven cores active, it doesn't really matter which of the cores. You know, as long as seven cores are active, it greatly increases the yield for them and that greatly reduces the cost. And they can offer, they can use those chips, they can offer those products at a less expensive price than they would otherwise. And then over time, the yield rates generally improve. And that's why we saw the 2020 iPad Pro with the A12Z chip that had all eight cores just fully operational. So I guess what we can extrapolate from this is that Foundry is gonna Foundry, and this gives some people the opportunity to buy lower priced versions of those products than would otherwise be possible. Win-win. Why are iPhone front cameras so good for video chat while Mac laptop webcams are comparatively so bad? And yeah, there's just real potatoes on those Mac cameras. And the reason is just physics. The thickness of an iPhone is much higher than the thickness of the lid on a MacBook. And cameras love Z-index, they love depth. Uh, that's why big lenses are so big. And that's why I've jokingly said, I will take a camera bump, I will take a notch, I will take anything I have to, to increase the, the depth of those lids so that we can fit 
better cameras, better optics into those things. Because unless and until we do, we are gonna be stuck with those incredibly, incredibly non-deep, shallow cameras uh, and they can throw all the image signal processing, all the algorithms, all the machine learning imaginable at those, and they're always gonna be constrained by the amount of data that they pull in. Paco Arango asks, any idea how far away the next Mac Pro is? And I guess there's two possible answers to this. If Apple does an update to the current Mac Pro, just so that it has the latest Intel and AMD silicon in it, then we could see that at any time. I actually was expecting one earlier because there are new chips and new cards available, but you know maybe some of Intel's more aggressive recent marketing uh, has put a, a cooler down on that. But in terms of an M series uh, Mac Pro, when Apple says it's a two year transition, I always think the Mac Pro is at the very end of that transition. When Apple did the previous PowerPC to Intel transition, the Mac Pro along with the now discontinued Xserve were the absolute last Macs to come out. So I think, you know, this fall, October at an early point for an M series Mac Pro, but realistically Apple has until WWDC 2022 to fully flesh out the entire lineup. Hal Berman on Patreon asks, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how the vectors of development, both hardware and software will proceed this year for the iPad relative to the Mac. And this is something I've actually been thinking about a lot lately especially when you start hearing people like on tech Twitter and tech YouTube say that Apple is listening and giving us more pro-centric features on the iPad and in iPad OS, because I worry at the same time that's making them too complicated for the mainstream, which was the original target for the iPad. When Steve Jobs reportedly said the iPad was the most important product he'd ever worked on, it was because his goal, his relentless objective was to make computing more and more accessible for the mainstream not just to give pros cooler, more whiz-bang tools, you know, sexier hardware, but to actually make computers for the rest of humanity, people who found Macs alienating and inaccessible and intimidating. And I worry that they really shouldn't be one size fits all for everybody, that you know, just the way that Apple said toaster fridges aren't good products, I think making a product that's dumbed down in some ways to be more accessible, but also complicated to the extent that it's not usable by a lot of people, but is more appealing to pros. Both of those make products that are divided against themselves. And I think that's what leads to a lot of the complaints from both sides. When someone says an iPad is becoming harder and harder to use, that hurts me because they, you know, we already, we nerds already have Android and PC and Mac and Linux and all of these things. And the general mainstream community doesn't they only have a few tools that they've found are really useful to them, things like Chromebooks and things like iPads. And I really don't want those taken away just because we, you know, again, we nerds look at that hardware and think it's so sexy and we just assume that everything should be for us when we're really just like five to 15% of the market. So what I am hoping is that Apple figures out a way to maintain meaningful differentiation where pros have all the tools necessary, maybe Mac biased to do everything we could possibly do and we're not working with dumbed down tools that are meant for a more mainstream. But at the same token that the iPad isn't rendered just hopelessly too complex for the mainstream. And even if it makes it less usable to us, we have the Mac, make the Mac better for us. Leave the iPad as something that is usable by everyone from like eight months to a hundred years old. People who have never used a computer before, make it the most approachable, accessible computing device ever and just sort of maybe keep that as a line of differentiation rather than making a bunch of products that slightly annoy everybody, make a couple of differentiated products that really appeal to the audience that they're aimed for. Rod Gray on Patreon asks, do you see Apple or any of the major tech companies holding in-person events this year? And I think, I think there'll be a range. I think there'll be some tech companies that are way too aggressive that wanna hold in-person events as soon as possible, probably irresponsibly uh, as soon as possible. And then there'll be some that are just much more conservative and may not hold any events this year at all, might wait until they look at the numbers coming into 2022 and see as close to zero risk as possible. Because I think ultimately all of this is just risk mitigation, how much risk the companies are willing to accept. And of course the people attending are willing to accept. And as you know, case numbers go down, hospitalization numbers go down, uh, death numbers obviously go down, vaccination numbers go up, 
it will be safer and safer to do these things. It's just always a question of, do you really need to do it? Do you really need to put people at risk? And what number of people at risk is acceptable to you and the people? So long answer short, I think so, yes. I don't think Apple would do it at all before a September or October iPhone event. And that would be the earliest possible time I could see Apple doing it. But I think realistically, we'll be into 2022 before things come back to normal. And I think by normal, it'll also mean a lot more events that we don't have to travel to, not because necessarily of pandemic concerns, but just because through all of this, we realize we don't need to have all of these in-person events anymore. There are some that make much more sense to do virtually. And Roland K. Smith also on Twitter says, with the new iPad Pros rumored to be as powerful as the M1 Max, will we finally see Final Cut Pro on iPad OS. The thing with Pro apps is that they are written in AppKit and Pro AppKit. I think those are the names for them, uh, which is a different way of writing apps than UIKit, which is what's used for the iPad, the iPhone, and for the Catalyst apps. And because you can compile, you can compile a, an Intel binary to run on the M1 using AppKit, that doesn't suddenly port AppKit over to the iPhone or the iPad at all. And that means that in order for Final Cut Pro or Logic Pro or Xcode to be moved to iOS, they would have to be taken from AppKit and Pro AppKit and rewritten entirely in UIKit. There's just no easy port for those things. And could Apple do that? Absolutely, they just have to devote their resources to it. But I think the bigger question that doesn't often get addressed is, what are Final Cut Pro and Logic Pro and Xcode on the iPad specifically? The iPad has been powerful enough for quite a while, for years, to run these apps because much less powerful versions of the Mac have been running them for a decade. The biggest physical constraint for an iPad is RAM because the highest RAM available on an iPad Pro is six gigabytes, while the lowest amount of RAM currently available on a Mac is eight gigabytes. And that's you know, a quarter different amount of RAM, and that's a lot. That's why I think Adobe has had has been struggling so much to bring, never mind a full version of Photoshop, but just a, a baseline functional version of real Photoshop to the iPad for the last couple of years. And Apple would face the same, the same constraints. And I think beyond even just the RAM, it's Apple figuring out what those apps really mean on the iPad. Are they standalone apps that will take some subset of functionality that works really well on the iPad, something like LumaFusion has already done and make that the app? Or are they something that works together, a companion app for the full version on the desktop where you offload some part of a project to work on it with an iPad and Apple Pencil in a way that works best in that modality, but always syncs back and lets you move back and forth with the main app? Or is it both? So it appeals to people who really, some people who want a standalone app and some people who want it as part of a larger workflow. And Apple is one of those measure a thousand times, cut one sort of companies. So I'm sure they've been working with this internally for a long time, but when and if they're happy enough to ship it, it's another one of those expect it when you see it sorts of things. But I would love it, I would love it uh, to be part of the next iPad Pro event, obviously. Frogbat on Twitter asked, what's the likelihood we'll ever see a prosumer monitor this year? So I, I would love it if Apple did what they used to do, and that is every time they introduce a new iMac, they introduce a new cinema display to go with it. Now, Apple did cancel their old LED cinema display uh, before, and my understanding is that a lot of people just don't use external displays. Again, Everyone in tech Twitter and tech YouTube loves external displays. We all want a personal NASA setup in front of us. But in terms of the general consumer market, it is a very, very small percentage and one that wasn't feasible. You know, Apple just decided they couldn't be in every business. So they canceled that. They canceled the router, much to my heartbreak and displeasure. And I always worry that there is a horn factor, sort of the opposite of a halo factor, where when you're looking at a beautiful display and it's got an Apple logo on it, it just increases your affinity for everything that Apple makes and you become more bought into the ecosystem. And then when Apple abandons something as visual, as front and center as a display and suddenly you're staring at someone else's logo, it sort of reduces your affinity for the brand and opens you up to you know, not the ecosystem, but exploring a wider range of options. And that's probably good for consumers, but not as good for Apple. So I'm just hoping that whatever spreadsheet, whatever pivot table Apple is looking at, you know, justifies this product 
if not fully based on its own merits, then based upon those other intangible merits that just make them willing to go all in on this, sort of like they've been willing to go in when all in on things like the Mac Pro recently. Todd Hoff on Twitter asks, will the Apple logo on my iCar glow? And yes, yes it will, Todd, if it glows. Archie G on Twitter asks, what's one product category you would love Apple to get into? I would just sincerely love Apple to make routers again. I'd actually love them to make all home security products for HomeKit. That includes routers and locks and cameras, anything that I need to really be able to trust the vendor of those products. And I know Apple makes HomeKit secure router, HomeKit secure video, but it's not enough for me. The bits leaving my house and the bits containing data about my house, I want them to be fully under the control of a company that I trust. And right now, in terms of privacy and security, that's Apple, and they're just not making them for me. Jonathan Bernstein asks, how much of a real risk is the most recent reported vulnerability to Apple Silicon and other Macs? And I did a whole video on that as well, so I'll link to that in the description. But basically, Apple made it so that software could be easily ported from Intel to Mac. It's what makes all the apps that we currently have on M1 possible. The developers were able to easily port them over. And sadly, that means bad actors can port their bad apps, their bad malware, spyware, adware, all that sort of stuff to M1 just as easily. But M1 has a bunch of security advantages from the silicon on up, similar to what iOS chipsets have been providing the iPhone and the iPad for years. So the hope is because Apple won't have to use as many software mitigations as they did on Intel, and they can do a lot more at the silicon level, that it'll just be harder for those sorts of malware to cause problems on the M1. But really, ultimately, all software, all hardware, everything is susceptible to bugs, is susceptible to issues. So what really matters is how well companies respond. And in that, we just have to always keep up immense pressure so that every company, including Apple, responds as fast as is inhumanly possible to anything that ever comes up. Do you think Apple has painted itself into a corner on some features where reversing previous decisions is more damaging to the brand than sticking with them? And no, I don't think anything is damaging to the brand. I do worry about the customer base though, because you know people complained when Apple went to all USB-C on the MacBook Pro, and now there are rumors that they're gonna go back to having MagSafe and SD cards. And with all USB-C, I can get an adapter and use almost anything, but if I have a MagSafe slot on a new Mac, I can't adapt that to anything. And if I have an SD card slot, I don't personally use SD cards, I use CF Express cards, I can't adapt that to everything. So if those end up being in addition to the USB-C ports, that's great. But if that ends up being you know, one for the other, we have less USB-C ports in exchange for having MagSafe or SD, then that's a net loss for me. And I worry that because the volume, like the, the loudness of tech Twitter and tech YouTube is so disproportionate to how much of the customer base it represents, that literally the squeaky wheels might be getting too much oil and it could lead to products that we think we want, but end up ultimately enjoying less. And for the extended version of this video where I managed to cram a few additional questions in, check out Nebula. That's where I post all of my videos, 100% ad-free, sponsor-free, uh, just with exactly those kinds of extra exclusive bonus content, like full length collabs, interviews, Q and A's, and my very first Nebula original, where some of my favorite YouTubers talk about how the iPhone has impacted their lives. And you can get a Nebula subscription absolutely for free when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description, or just go to curiositystream.com slash Rene Ritchie. That means for less than $15 a year, you'll get access to their thousands of documentaries and series, like The Joy of Data with mathematician Hannah Fry. What is data? How is it stored, shared, made sense of? And what does data reveal about us and the world? As well as all the ad-free and often extended videos on Nebula from Wendover and Half as Interesting, Polymatter and Medlife Crisis, Up and Atom, Soaps Notes, Braincraft, and so many more. And right now, CuriosityStream is 26% off with Nebula bundled in for free, making it not only a great way to support this channel, educational content, and independent creators, but just the best deal in streaming, period. So click on the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie and then go watch my original. For more on everything Apple is doing in 2021, hit the playlist above. I'm covering all the products, all the features, so you can figure out how you wanna spend your hard-earned money this year. Hit the playlist and I'll see you in the next video.